No. All right, implicit differentiation. All right, basically what we're doing this for, we're going to do an example that is easy to start with, one that we do not need to use implicit for in order to show you how it works, but the goal of it is not to do problems like this one, y equals 2 over x, because we know how to take the derivative of y equals 2 over x, right? What we don't know is how to take the derivative of something in this form, x, y equals 2. Now, does everybody agree that these are equivalent equations? This is the implicit form because it is not solved for y. This is the explicit form because it is solved for y. Now, given a choice, remember I'm attached here, given the choice that when you are doing a problem, if I can solve it for y and take the derivative, I am going to do that. However, there will be times where I may not be able to solve for y, so I need a different technique in order to take the derivative. The key that you're going to be looking at in this problem is to remember that the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx, and the derivative of x with respect to x, technically we have not been writing this, but it's dx dx, which is 1, okay? So anytime we are doing a derivative, when we have a y involved, if we are differentiating with respect to x, you have to remember to do chain rule, okay? So, like, for example, let's add an additional one here. If I wanted to take the derivative of y squared with respect to x, the key here is to recognize that you are taking the derivative of y, but it's with respect to x. So, y is a function of x. What do you have to do when you have chain rule? You would take the derivative, you have stuff squared. What's the derivative of stuff squared? Two times that stuff, but then you have to follow it with stuff prime, the derivative of the stuff, which is dy dx, okay? So it's a chain rule problem. That's what implicit is going to remember when we do these problems, that every time you take the derivative of a variable that is not the one you're taking the derivative with respect to, it's a chain rule problem. And you have to always follow it with the derivative of that y. Just another example, what if I wanted to do the derivative of sine of y with respect to x? Chain rule problem because y is not x. It's y is a function of x. If it helps, you can kind of think of this as f of x. And can you see why this is a chain rule problem? It's the sine of f of x. So you would take the derivative of sine, which is cosine, times dy dx. So it's nothing more than chain rule, and that's what we have to remember when we see this. All right, now I'm going to show this problem two different ways. The old way, which is the easy way, I agree with you. The new way, the implicit way, I'm showing you because the problems we're going to do, we can't solve for y in them. But I'm showing you with an easier one just to show you that it works and that you get the same answer as we would have with the easy method. All right, so if I wanted to find the derivative of y with respect to x in explicit form, even though we didn't show this step, essentially what you were doing was taking the derivative of both sides. And oh, how can I rewrite 2 over x into a nicer form, take the derivative? 2x to the negative 1 with respect to x. So we were taking the derivative of both sides. We just, in our mind, automatically converted the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx. And what's the derivative of 2x to the negative 1? Negative 2, x to the negative 2, or negative 2 over x squared. So that's fairly simple and straightforward. Now, what I am showing you with this implicit form is a different technique of taking the derivative. Yes, this is longer and harder than what I just did. But I would never use this on this problem. I'm going to use it on problems I can't solve for y. I just want to show you the technique, show you that it works, and get you the same answer. So when you do implicit form, and we're going to take the derivative, you have to show the first step that you are taking the derivative and what you are taking the derivative with respect to. And you have to do it to both sides. Okay. We kind of skip that step when we're doing it in the explicit form because it's kind of unnecessary. But in implicit, you must show this step. The AP greater 
is expecting to see that, oh, they're taking implicit differentiation. They took the derivative of both sides. And it is very important that you show what you are taking the derivative with respect to, because that will matter. Now, when you're looking at this left-hand side, what rule am I going to have to use? Product rule. I have x times y. So I'm going to have to take the product rule. So I'm going to, I'm going to write it all out this first time. So I'm going to take x times the derivative of y with respect to x plus y times the derivative of the x with respect to x, right? I'm just doing product rule. What about derivative of a constant? Zero. Doesn't matter what I'm taking the derivative with respect to. So over here in simplifying, the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx. The derivative of x with respect to x is 1 equals 0. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for dy dx. And now I'm trying to show that this derivative, this technically, you have taken the derivative. This is called the implicit form of the derivative. It's just not solved for dy dx. So typically, to kind of work with this, some instances we would like to solve for dy dx. So I'm solving for dy dx in order to show you that it's the same answer that I got earlier. I'm going to subtract y and divide by x. So dy dx equals negative y over x. And at that point, you might be going, that's not the same thing. This and this don't match. But I'm going to remind you, don't you know what y is equal to in this problem? y is 2 over x. So if I were to take this y out and put in 2 over x, this would become negative 2 over x divided by x. And what is negative 2 over x divided by x? Negative 2 over x squared. It's the same formula. They are exactly the same. They're finding the same derivative. They're just in different forms. This form here is explicitly solved for your derivative, but it's an implicit form because your derivative, your slope, depends on both y and x. And in a lot of cases, that's perfectly fine. We can use this formula to find slopes at points on curves as long as we know what about the point. Not only the x, you have to also know the y. So it's just a formula where you have to have a little bit more information than what we had before. But it is exactly the same formula. Now, the beauty of this and why it's the most important kind of application here is that in most application problems, what we're doing is we're taking the derivative with respect to one variable, but we have many variables. Now, I agree, this is a made-up problem. Uh, this is a kind of a fakey made-up problem, which, which I admit. But this is kind of a precursor to an application that's going to be coming at the end of this chapter called related rates. A rate is a derivative. Okay? Related simply means, hey, I'm going to have a whole bunch of rates, derivatives, that are related to each other. Now, this is a fake problem, so I'm, but I'm just giving it to you to see what's going on. We have a business model, and in this business model, our quote-unquote success is a function of four things. How much money I spend on advertising, how many employees I staff my business with, uh, my overhead costs and my operating costs, how much I have to spend on that, and then if you happen to have any unforeseen natural disasters, that could impact my success. Okay? And some brilliant economist has figured out this equation that relates these four variables together with my success of my company. Okay? So then the first thing after we get that, we say, all right, I want to analyze, because it's always about predicting. Maybe I want to make a change. Maybe I want to tweak how much money I spend on advertising. And I would like to know, if I were to change the amount of money that I spend on advertising, what would the change in my success be? Would I make more money? Would I make less money? So now think about what I just said. If I tweak the amount of money, I'm, I'm basically changing the amount of money, and I'm trying to determine the change in success based on the change in money. What is that? What are they actually asking you to find? DSDM. Okay, so in part A, 
you're trying to find the derivative of your success, the change in your success based on your change in your money. That's what I'm interested in figuring out. How much change in my success will I have based on the change in my money? So when I do that, and again, first step, you always show this in implicit. And also, how do I know that this is an implicit differentiation problem? It's implicit because I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to m, but how many variables do I have over here? I have four, and they're not all m's. So as soon as I see that I have other variables involved, I know this is going to be an implicit differentiation. So I'm going to take the derivative of each of these terms. But I'm taking the derivative with respect to the amount of money that I spend. So would you agree that there has to be some contribution to the change in success, that if I were to change money spent on advertising, could that affect and change my number of employees? Does everybody see that that would probably be a contribution, that maybe if I had more advertising, I'm selling more, which means I need more employees, all right? Maybe if I have my change in uh, money that I'm spending on advertising, could the change in my operating costs and my overhead costs change? If I have more, maybe I need more factories. Maybe something's going to change based on that. And this one's a, a little bit of a stretch. Natural disasters. Would there be some change in the amount of success contributed to natural disasters based on the fact that I changed the money? Maybe not. But I'm still going to take it into account, even if its rate is zero. Because if the change in natural disaster based on the change in money is zero, well, that's important to know, right? It's not going to contribute anything to the change in success. But I'm still going to take that into account. So when I run this through and I actually take the derivative, we're going to get ds dm. And what we're going to think each time we look at these variables your E, your employees, your operating costs, and your natural disasters, we are going to think of these as functions of M. So that it's going to be a chain rule problem. That what we're going to do when we run through this is every single time I take the derivative of something that is a function of M, that in my head I'm thinking that's a function of M, what do you always have to do when you take the derivative? The derivative of 3E squared. 6e times, because that's a function right there. What's chain rule tell you to do? Is it 3e cubed? Oh, I can't read. That's all right. 3e cubed. All right, so what would be the derivative of 3e cubed? If I change it to 3u squared, or 3u cubed, 3u cubed, what would be the derivative of it? 9u squared times du, d, whatever you're, you see how it's chain rule? We have a chain rule problem. We're thinking of this as e of m, which means you have to follow it with a chain rule, okay? So the actual derivative running through would be the derivative of 2m squared would be 4m. I don't have to do chain rule on that because m is the variable I'm taking the derivative with respect to. But then I go plus 3 times 3. I can't add. This is the end of the day, and I can't, I can't multiply. <laughs> 3 times 3 is 9e squared de dm. What does de dm refer to? The change in my employee cost based on the fact that I changed my money. I have to take that into account. Minus 20o cubed d o d m the change in my operating cost based on the fact that i changed my money in advertising minus two-thirds times six four n to the fifth d n d m and yes it's a stretch you're going to say there is no change in my natural disaster cost based on the fact that i changed my advertising that might be true which means that does this term contribute anything to my change in my success no, because there's no change based on that. And that's important to know, but we're still going to take it into account, and that's going to be my derivative. And do you see how this is called a related rates problem? It's finding the change in success based on the fact that I changed my money, but I have to take into account all of these related rates that got changed because I changed the money too. All right? 
Look at part B. What is B asking me to find? Find the number, if I were to tweak, change, the number of employees on staff. So what are they asking me to find there? Change in success based on change in employees. So I can take the same problem that we had, except now I'm not taking the derivative with respect to M, I'm taking the derivative with respect to E. So the first step is really just writing down the, hey, I'm taking the derivative of both sides. But now I'm taking the derivative of both sides with respect to E, a different variable. So now when I run through the problem, M is now a function of E, O is a function of E, and N is a function of E. And so we go to take the derivative, ds de equals, now instead of just putting 4m, what do I have to put? 4m dm de plus, now this one, 3e cubed becomes... 9e e squared and nothing follows it, because technically it's de, de, but that's 1, so we don't have to write it, minus my 20o cubed do, de, minus my 4 n to the 5th dn, de. Does that make sense? Right here? Yes, because I'm bringing down, I'm saying this is what I did, and this is the next equivalent equation. So you have to have both parts. It's not a transitive thing. Well, because now here I'm trying to say I'm taking the derivative of the left-hand side of the equation with respect to m, and I'm taking the derivative of the right-hand side of the equation with respect to m. So I'm showing I'm taking the derivative of both sides, and then I'm actually doing it in the next step. And that's what they want to see on the AP. Okay? And then let's do the last one. And at a certain point, you, once you see how this works, in C, what are we trying to tweak? The operating cost. So we're trying to find DS, DO. And yes, we should write, I know it gets tedious, I am taking the derivative of both sides with respect to O. So I rewrite it. And then we simply just run through and take the derivative, and it should be fairly straightforward. ds do equals 4m dm do plus 9e squared de do minus 20o cubed. Everybody okay? Nothing's going to follow that one. And then minus my 4n to the fifth dn. D-O. All right, so the other thing is, is that usually when we use implicit, we're looking at curves that are not functions. That we typically would only be using this if it is very difficult to solve for y explicitly. If I have trouble solving for y, or if maybe I could, but it's just, nah, I don't really feel like it, I can always use implicit differentiation. Okay? Usually in the types of problems that you're going to see, you will be able to solve for dy dx after you take the differentiation implicitly, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do problems where you use the slope to do something because you need to have a formula for slope. So they're going to give you things that you can actually solve for dy dx after the fact. All right, note number one, this has to do with what you're showing the greater, that when you take the derivative implicitly, you have to show you're taking the derivative of both sides. That's where you need to show the derivative of the left-hand side with respect to whatever it is you're taking it with respect to. Right now, we're going to do a bunch of examples where you are going to do it uh, only with respect to x. But once we get into related rates, you'll have to say, I was taking the derivative with respect to the radius. I was taking the derivative with respect to the length of the box. I was taking the derivative with respect to time. So that is something that you're going to be looking at. You'll have to say what I'm taking the derivative with respect to. So this is more of a, hey, reader, 
I am doing it with respect to this. That's what you're showing that side for. The second thing is, and even though these are equivalent notations, your dy dx and your y prime, they are equivalent. However, when we are doing these problems, I prefer dy dx, mostly because you lose information if you go to y prime. Because if you write y prime, what do you take the derivative with respect to? You don't know. So I prefer to do dy dx. And this is especially important in related rates because I might be doing derivative of area, but I could be doing derivative of area with respect to the radius. I can be doing derivative of area with respect to time. I could be doing derivative of area with respect to surface area. So there could be multiple things going on, so I prefer to use this notation. I also think it's confusing that y prime and y to the first look the same, and y'all can get confused in the middle of it. So use dy dx for me in this problem. I think it makes it a little easier. All right. I do know that y prime is faster to write, but let's not be lazy. Let's do the dy dx because I think it will work out better. All right, so let's look at some examples of where we're using this. And hopefully you can see right here is my equation. And do you all see why we need implicit at this point? Can you solve that for y? Yeah, that's going to be pretty difficult. So I want to talk about the slope of the graph of this at this point. Now I'm going to show you two different ways to do this problem. All right. I'm going to show, they'll, they'll both start the same way. So the first step of this is going to be the same for both A and B. So I'm just going to do that up here at the top. I'm going to take the derivative. Why do I know that I need to do the derivative? Slope is derivative, which is dy dx. Okay, so I know I need to find dy dx. So because I'm doing it implicitly, I'm going to take the derivative of both sides. The derivative of y cubed plus y squared minus 5y minus x squared with respect to x. And we're taking the derivative of negative 4 with respect to x. So I show that I am doing implicit differentiation by showing I'm taking the derivative of both sides with respect to the variable x. So what does that mean whenever I take the derivative of something with a y in it? What rule am I going to have to use? Chain rule, okay? So you're going to have to follow it with dy dx every single time you have that. So running through the derivative, we would end up, what's the derivative of y cubed then? 3y squared dy dx, because of the chain rule, plus derivative of y squared, 2y dy dx, derivative of negative 5y, minus 5 dy dx. Now the derivative of minus x squared, minus 2x. If you want to, you can go dx dx, but what's dx dx? 1, so it can go away. Equals, what's the derivative of a constant? 0, no matter what you're taking the derivative with respect to. All right, so this part is the same for both a and b. I took the derivative, implicitly I get this. Now, there are two choices from this point. I'm trying to find the slope at 1, negative 3. So in part A, what they're telling you to do in part A is find dy dx. In other words, find a formula by solving for dy dx in that problem. So once you take the derivative implicitly, you can solve for dy dx. Now, this is a factoring problem. This is algebra 2. If I have dy dx here, here, and here, can I move the 2x over to the other side and then factor out dy dx and then divide? And can we do that all in one step? We don't need to, we don't need to show intermediate steps. We can go, hey, dy dx equals move the 2x over, 2x, divided by... I'm going to factor out dy dx. What's left after I take it away from the first term? 3y squared. I'm putting it in the bottom because I would divide it over. Plus 2y minus 5. So that is my formula for my derivative. Now notice that this formula for the derivative, what's kind of not so nice about it, is this derivative, in order for me to find my slope, what do I have to know? Not just the x, I have to know the y. So now this problem asks you to find the slope at 1, negative 3. 
Now when you go to show your work for this, so this is the formula. Now I'm going to evaluate it. I gotta find the slope at one negative three. So when we write this down, this is a notation. What did we used to do when we said find dy dx and we did the evaluate bar? What went here? x equals 1, whatever it is. But the problem with this is our formula depends on not just x, but on x and y. So we change this slightly and we just put the point there to say, hey, we're going to evaluate this at 1 for x and negative 3 for y. And then we can plug and chug and do our 2 times 1 3 times negative 3 squared plus 2 times negative 3 minus 5 and then do our basic arithmetic and you end up with, what is this, 27 minus 6, 21 minus 5, 16, 2 over 16 which is 1 eighth. So the slope at the point 1 negative 3 on that curve is 1 eighth. Do I know what that curve looks like? It's not a function, who knows? I have the faintest idea what it looks like. Don't care. I just needed to find the slope. All right, so that's option one. You take the implicit derivative. You solve for dy dx to get a formula. That formula can be dependent on x and y. We don't care about that. Now we can evaluate it and find the slope at 1, negative 3 by plugging it in. All right, option two. Option two is if I want to find the slope, at a specific point, do I really care about this intermediate step of getting a formula? I really don't need the formula, I just need the actual slope value. So the second option is to plug in your point, 1, negative 3, right now, before solving. Why would we do that? Because it's easier to deal with numbers than it is to deal with variables. So once we do that, and let's say we just show the plugging in, we would end up with 3 times negative 3 squared dy dx plus 2 times negative 3 dy dx. All right, so we have 2 times negative 3 dy dx minus my 5 dy dx minus 2 times 1 equal to 0. And then once I do that, it basically ends up being a combined like terms problem. I have 27 of the dy dx's minus 6 of the dy dx's minus 5 of the dy dx's, and that's equal to 2. If I move that over, and how many of these do I have? 16 of the dy dx's equal to 2, so dy dx equals 1 eighth. Do you see why that might be advantageous? Because it's easier to solve. There's no algebra. It's plug the numbers in, collect like terms, and then solve for dy dx. So depending on what we're doing, if I need a formula, I would do this method. But if I don't need a formula and I just need the slope at 1, negative 3, a lot of times we just plug it in and go from there because it's easier. All right, a couple of applications. Why do we want to look at our derivative? One of the things that we're going to do is we like to know where there's horizontal tangents. Horizontal tangents occur when your slope is equal to zero, and I'm re-emphasizing here that really it's zero over a non-zero number, okay? Because we're going to have fractions in these implicit problems, and probably like 99% of the time. If you see this on the AP, it's going to have a fraction. So you have to do zero in the numerator, non-zero in the denominator. If you want to look for vertical tangents, that would be when you have non-zero over zero. Okay. And I'm taking out the derivative equal to zero over zero because if that happens, that means that it was probably a discontinuity on the original function or not defined on the original function, which means that if you are not continuous, then you are not differentiable. And if you are not differentiable, then you do not have a tangent line, which means you don't have a slope. So you always want to make sure that that special case is something that you take into account. All right, let's look at some examples. All right, example three, we want to find the coordinates on a graph. Now, again, you have to recognize that I am starting with problems that are super easy to show you how it works. 
This is not what you would get on the AP, all right? Because I can answer this question without calculus. I want to know where the graph of x squared plus y squared equal to 25, which is a graph of what? A circle centered at the origin with a radius of 5. So that point would be 5, 0, and so on. So we already know what this graph looks like. And if I were to ask you the question, where does it have a, you know, I'm just like really sad walking around here. I'm really better than this at times. It's like the simple algebra one. 0, 5, this one would be negative 5, 0, and 0, negative 5. Okay. Where do I have horizontal tangents? At what points? Horizontal tangent lines occur at 0, 5, the top, and 0, negative 5. See, done. I didn't have to use calculus for that because I already know what the picture looks like. Where do I have vertical tangent lines? Negative 5, 0, and 5, 0. You're like, hey, done with that problem. They won't give you one this easy on the AP. I'm using this to help you see what's going on, and then we'll work our way to a harder problem. All right, so now let's use calculus to verify what we already know. All right, so what do I have to do first if I want to determine where I have horizontal and vertical tangent lines if I had no idea what the graph looked like? Take the derivative, and this is not solved for y, so I'm going to take the derivative implicitly. So step one, we're going to do implicit differentiation. So I show what I'm doing. I'm taking the derivative of x squared plus y squared with respect to x, and I'm taking the derivative of 25 with respect to x. So I show I'm taking the derivative of both sides and what I'm taking the derivative with respect to. What's the derivative of x squared with respect to x? 2x. The derivative of y squared with respect to x? 2y dy dx. And then the derivative of 25 with respect to x? 0. All right. I need to solve for dy dx because horizontal tangent lines occur when your slope, dy dx, equals 0 over non-zero. So I'm going to solve, I'm going to get my formula. So dy dx, I subtract 2x and then divide by 2y, so I get negative x over y. Everybody okay with that? All right, so once we get to here, now I'm ready to actually answer the question. So let's do horizontal tangents first. And this is part of the showing your work. Uh, this is going to be a free response question usually. So you would need to write down, hey, horizontal tangents, this occurs when dy dx equals 0 over non-zero. I write that down because the grader wants to give you a point for that. So you write it down, so they will give you a point for knowing what you're supposed to be looking for. Then I put my formula in, negative x over y equal to 0 over non-zero. When does that happen? When is that fraction equal to 0? When x equals 0. Now, go back and read the question. What did they ask me to find? I figured out the x value at which I have horizontal tangents, but it asked me for the, for the coordinates. So am I done with this problem? Plug 0 into where? Well, there's no f of x. We don't have a function. x squared plus y squared, your original equation. So use the original equation to find the coordinates. So we have x squared plus y squared equals 25. 0 squared plus y squared equals 25. What's y equal to? Positive or negative 5, which is why we have two points, 0, 5, and 0, negative 5, which matches what we already knew the answer was. Yes, ma'am. Well, typically you want to tell them because the, the easier it is for the grader to follow your work, the better off you will be. 
And having random stuff all over the page, while it might make sense to you in your head, it's always good to tell the reader what you're doing. So that's why I would actually write exactly this when I'm doing it. I would say, hey, horizontal tangents are happening when the derivative is 0 over non-zero. Here's my formula. This is when it happens. Now I'm going to find my coordinates so they can follow along and you'll get full credit for it. Okay? All right, let's do our vertical tangents. All right, so the only difference here, this is going to occur when my dy dx is equal to non-zero over zero. So again, my negative x over y equals non-zero over zero when y is equal to zero. But again, we're not done. What do we have to do after we figure that part out? Find the coordinates. So I'm going to use the original equation to find the coordinates. So x squared plus 0 squared equals 25. And again, x equals. Yeah, and notice, do I need to show intermediate steps for basic algebra 2 solving? No. Show what you did and then do it. And then write your two points, negative 5, 0, and 5, 0. And again, this is an easy problem because you should already be able to visualize. I'm working you toward, I have no idea what the thing looks like. Here's how I find it. Now we have one more question. At what point is the slope 3 fourths? At what point is the slope 3 fourths? All right, so now we want to figure out at what point is the slope equal to negative 3 fourths. What I don't want you to do is, yes, when, to do this, we're saying dy dx equals negative 3 fourths which our formula, negative x over y, equals negative 3 fourths. What I don't want you to do is to automatically say x is negative 3 and y is 4 or negative 4 or something like that because you have to be careful on these things. How do we know that it's not a 6 and an 8? That, that you have to, there's a couple of things that you want to worry about here. What you get from this is not I know what x and y are. What I get is a relationship between x and y. If I were to multiply both sides by y, I basically would know that negative 3 times y would equal negative 4 times x, right? I'm just multiplying, cross multiplying. Or I would be 3y equals 4x. That's a relationship between x and y. That doesn't tell me x is certain thing with y. It tells me that I have a relationship with x and y. So what do we do to actually solve for x and y? Which equation? The original. Do you see that you kind of have a system right here? That the point that we're looking for not only has to satisfy this relationship between x and y, it has to satisfy the relationship that x squared plus y squared equals 25. I have to be on the circle and have that relationship for the derivative. And so it's a system. How do I solve a system? Substitution. Does it matter which one that we're going to substitute? No, not really. Uh, let's go solve for y. This would give me y equals 4 thirds x. So I'm going to substitute that into the second one. So x squared plus 4 thirds x squared equals 25. I'm going to solve for x. 16 ninths x squared plus x squared equals 25. What should I do with these two things? Combine them, common denominator. Let's do 9 over 9. 16 plus 9, 25 ninths x squared equals 25. x squared equals 9, so x equals plus or minus 3. All right. Now, what's the, I'm not done, because what do I need to do? Because I don't want to know the x values, I need to know the y values. So where do I, how do I find the y values? We're going to plug in x equal to 3. Where are we going to plug x equal to 3 in? 
Either one. Either one. But we're smart. We're an AP calculus. Which of my two choices, which one am I going to use? Yeah, let's use the first one. Isn't that a heck of a lot easier when we're doing it? And I have a negative mistake somewhere. Can y'all find it? There you go. See, I always got to have my... I, I knew there was something wrong in there when I was doing this. So that would be that. So this should be negative. It doesn't really change much, right? Negative. Because that's negative, what happens? Square it. I still get plus or minus 3. What matters is now when I go to plug it in. So if I can use either of these, which one's the easier one to use? The linear one. Why go with the quadratic? Choose the linear one. So y would equal negative 4 thirds times 3 or negative 4. So our point 3, negative 4. And then I'm going to let x equal negative 3. And then my point would be negative 4 thirds times negative 3 or 4. So negative 3, 4. Most of the time, and this is what makes these types of problems hard, is that a lot of times you will end up with a system that you have to solve. And there's a lot of algebra involved. All right, let's look at example four. We want to find the coordinates of the horizontal and vertical tangent lines given by this equation. Now, one thing that we need to think about with that one is, hmm, what am I going to have to do when I do the derivative of that term? have x times y, the multiplication the product rule, okay? So you've got to be very careful. Most problems that students have with this has to be running through the derivative. So we're going to do implicit differentiation because I want to find horizontal and vertical tangent lines, so I know I have to do implicit. So I'm going to take the derivative of 2x squared plus xy plus 4y squared with respect to x. I'm going to take the derivative of 3 with respect to x. The derivative of 2x squared is 4x plus, now I'm going to use product rule. Let's put some, I'll come back to that in a second. That's hard. I go, eh, I don't want to do that yet. So I do that last. Uh, what's the derivative of 4y squared? 8y dy dx. And the derivative of the constant? Zero. And then I come back in here and I do the product rule because that's hard. Well, not really that hard, but hard enough. So the derivative of, we have first times the derivative of the second. What's the derivative of y? dy dx plus the second, y, times derivative of the first. What's the derivative of x? 1. So I use my product rule there. And because I'm doing horizontal and vertical tangents, I am going to solve for dy dx. If you need to show the steps, do so, because I'd rather you get it right than miss it. So anything that has dy dx, I'm going to keep it on the same side. Anything that doesn't have dy dx, I'm going to ship it to the other side. So I would have minus 4x minus y. And then can we pull the dy dx out and divide in the same step? So dy dx equals negative 4x minus y over x plus 8y. So I get my implicit differentiation, and then I find my formula for my slope. And then we have two parts to this. Do y'all need, still need a copy? Yeah. All right, what do you want to do first, horizontal or vertical tangents? Horizontal. All right, so horizontal tangents. That would be when dy dx equals 0 over non-zero. I know I wrote it above, but remember this is AP. We're going to do it. Tell them what you're going to do. So our formula is negative 4x minus y over x plus 8y equals 0 over non-zero. So where are we going to go from here? Negative 4x minus y equals 0 or y equals negative 4x. As soon as I see that and I go, I didn't solve for x or y, there must be a 
system, what's my system? Y equals negative 4X, and then what else do we know? Where's the other equation for my system? The point I'm looking for, the formula, 2X squared plus XY plus 4Y squared equals 3. You're like, oh, nasty system. But that's not too bad to solve. Can I plug in negative 4X for Y? All right, let's do that. So we end up with 2x squared plus x times negative 4x, negative 4x squared, and then 4y squared, 4 times what's y squared? I'm squaring it. 16x squared equal to 3. All right, combine like terms. I have 4 times... 16, which is 64 of them, minus 4, 60, plus 2, 62, x squared equals 3, x equals plus or minus the square root of 3 over 62. We cheer because AP doesn't require simplifying. I don't need to rationalize. I don't need to worry about that stuff. They're done. Except for that's only the x. What am I supposed to find? The coordinates. So finding the coordinates, where do I plug this back into? The, could be the original equation. Oh yeah, let's go for the easy one. Let's plug it back in there, because that's way easier. I don't want to have to do all the work of that one. So the x, if I have square root, the positive one, then the y would be, see how easy that is? Negative 4 times that. That's point 0.1. Point 0.2, if I have the negative... Then I have negative 4 times that, and then we're done. Oop. That would be positive, because negative times negative is positive. So those would be the two locations where I have horizontal tangents. Now I have one more thing that I need to check. I did not need to do this in the previous example because it was obvious. Remember that it's only a horizontal tangent when the derivative is 0 over non-zero. You better check that, because if it's 0 over 0, it's not a horizontal tangent, it's a discontinuity, so you would say none if that was true. So I just need to make sure the denominator, my x plus 8y, if I use this point, would this square root plus 8 times this square root equal 0? No. So I just need to check it, all right? And then I check this one, and it's not going to work either. So check... The denominator does not equal zero so that we are not in that weird case where it was a discontinuity. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to let you guys do the vertical tangents on your own. Not right now. So do that on your own and finish it. We'll see if we have time at the end of class for you to do that. Let's come down to example five. All right, in example five, I wanted to find the equation of the tangent line at the point 3, 1. What do I need in order to find the equation of the tangent line? This problem should be old hat by now. You need the slope, and we need the slope at 3, 1, and we have a point, which is... 3, 1. So we're halfway there. We have the point. We just need to find the slope. So how would I find the slope? What are you basically having to find in order to find the slope? What am I trying to find? The derivative dy dx. I need a formula for finding the slope. Alright, so how am I going to find the derivative? What do I have to use? What kind of differentiation? What is this whole section on? Implicit. Do you see my formula? Does that solve for y? No. So I'm going to use implicit differentiation. So I'm going to take the derivative of both sides, 3x squared plus y squared squared, with respect to x, taking the derivative of 100xy with respect to x. Now, does everybody see why we have to show this step again? Because you've got to show I'm taking the derivative of both sides, and I'm doing it with respect to x. Now, let's plan, let's work ahead a little bit here and be very careful. Over on this side, what am I going to have to use over here? 
product rule because I have 100x times y. Two variables multiplied. So this one I'm going to have to use the product rule. Now over here, what do I have to worry about here? I have 3 times some stuff squared chain rule and the implicit part of it too. So you can think of this like your u. You don't have to write the u down. I'm showing you I have 3 u squared. So when I take the derivative, I'm going to have to do 6 u and then the derivative of u. All right, everybody good? So now that I've looked at it and I'm ready to go, now I'm going to take my derivative. So 3 u squared, the derivative is 6 whatever the u was to the first times the derivative of the u, which hopefully you can go, hey, 2x plus 2y dy dx. And then we get over to this side. i got to take the derivative, and I have to use the product rule. So I would have first times derivative of the second, which is what, dy dx, plus second times derivative of the first, what's the derivative of 100x? 100. So that gets us to here. Now remember, you have two options from this point. I could solve for dy dx, and then plug in the point. Plug in my 3, 1. Or, I could plug in 3, 1, then solve for dy dx. Yeah, do I really need the formula for dy dx? Do I really care what the formula is? No, all I care about is what is the value of the slope. So plan accordingly. Do the short one. Be smart. So we're going to choose this option. Plug in 3, 1 and solve for dy dx. If we want to show that we're plugging it in, we can go, hey, that evaluate bar is really great. We're going to evaluate this derivative we just found at 3, 1. So I can show that by just sticking it on the end. So then we can go to the next step and go 6 times 3 squared would be 9 plus 1 squared, 1. And then 2 times 3 is 6 plus 2 times 1, 2 dy dx equals 100 times 3 dy dx plus 1 times 100, 100. So I plug everything in. And then now I solve for dy dx, which is a lot easier. We end up with 10 times 6, which is 60. 60 times 6, 360 plus 120 dy dx, 300 dy dx plus 100. And then what should I do from there? So I'll find, combine like terms. Subtract 120. 180 dy dx, add, subtract 100 equals 260, divide by 180, and what do we get? 26 divided by 18, which is 13 over 9 equals dy dx. Am I done with the problem, though? The equation of the tangent line. So we have one more step, the equation of the tangent line, y equals 13 ninths x minus 3 plus 1. And then we're done with that problem. Now, kind of forestalling a common mistake that I see in this problem, not that any of you would ever do this, sometimes y'all get a little confused about what you have. If you had solved for dy dx and you get this formula over here, what typically happens, this is the mistake, and probably about 5 out of 30 people will do this. And I'm not sure why this is a common mistake, but I'm just going to try to fix it before we get to the quiz. Y'all find dy dx, you solve for it, you do all this work, and you get this formula. And then you go to write the equation of the tangent line, and you put the formula in that spot right there. Why would that be wrong? Because you don't want the formula for the slope. You want to find a specific slope at 
three one. So it's like y'all forget to plug in the three one to get the actual value of the slope. You try to put a formula in that location, and then you get confused and you don't understand why nothing works and it looks weird because it is weird. You want to plug in and find the slope and then go to the equation of the tangent line. Okay. All right, we have one more page. Example six and seven. So we're going to start with example six. Mostly because it's fun. Because what do I have in here that you have to worry about? Oh, let's see. I have a tangent with a product inside and a square. Oh, I have a three-link chain rule problem going on. All right, so I'm going to, and when I rewrite this, I'm going to go, I'm doing implicit. Why am I doing implicit? It's solved for Y. Because I have y's on the other side. It's not solved for y. It happens to have a y on one side, but it's not solved for y. So I'm going to take the derivative of the y with respect to x, and I'm going to take the derivative of x squared plus y squared minus, and I'm going to rewrite this so that I can see the three links in my chain to know that the most, the outermost function is the square. Shh. The outermost function is the square. The next one in is a tangent, and then the inside is the x, y with a product rule. Okay? And again, I stop doing u and v and all of that stuff when I'm doing this. All right, so instead of doing u and v, what I'm basically going to do is remember to take the derivative of the outside function with the stuff inside. Then I'm going to take the derivative of the next function in with the stuff inside, and then I'm going to take the derivative of the innermost function. So that way I can get the three links to my chain. So I don't have to do all the u and the v and get myself confused. All right, so let's take the derivatives. So we have dy, dx, that's the easy one. Derivative of x squared, 2x. The derivative of y squared, 2y, dy, dx, minus, now I'm going to take the derivative of stuff squared, so two times that stuff to the first times, now I have to take the derivative of the stuff, so now I'm working my way in. Now I need the derivative of tangent. Derivative of tangent is secant squared with its inside stuff times, now I gotta go all the way in to the derivative of xy, which is product rule, and that's an easy one, we just did it. So it would be x dy dx, plus y. So I have taken the derivative here, but unfortunately it says find dy dx. What does that mean? Solve. I have to find the formula, so I have to solve for dy dx. So we have a little bit of algebra 2 to do. Uh, and, and this is where you have to be careful. I have a dy dx here. I have one here, and I have one over here. So what do I need to do with those three things? Combine like terms, get them on the same side. So dy dx, let's move this term over. So I'm going to subtract 2y dy dx. And then over here, you have to be careful. Y'all recognize that this is just one big number right here? And that you're technically distributing this through these parentheses where you had that product rule? Everybody okay? So what I really want to take to the other side, I have minus this stuff here times x dy dx, and then I need to move it to the other side so it becomes positive. So it'd be plus, change color here, plus 2 tangent of xy secant squared of xy times x dy dx equals, and then whatever's left on that side, 2x from here, and then this times y, so minus 2y tangent of xy secant squared of xy. I really think that these problems turn into organization and keeping track of all the pieces, as ugly as they are. Now that I have dy dx all on the same side over here, these are all grouped together, what do I want to do with the dy dx? Factor it out. dy dx equals 1, oops, sorry, I'm factoring, not equals yet. Nice. 
So dy dx, 1 minus 2y plus 2 tangent of xy secant squared of xy. And can I write this x at the end? It's bothering me there. Can I put it right here and say plus 2x? And that's all equal to 2x minus 2y. Your hand's starting to hurt yet? Secant squared of xy. And then what's the last step? Divide it out. So dy dx equals, and because I don't have room, I'm going to do parentheses, 2x minus 2y tangent xy secant squared xy. Close your parentheses, divided by, let's see if I can squeeze it in, 1 minus 2y plus 2 tangent xy secant squared xy. xy, there. Get it all squeezed in there. Tedious, right? There's algebra in this. You know where everybody messes up? Algebra. Algebra, algebra. There's two, two sources of error. You forget to follow the dy dx on some one of the terms, or you fall down in the middle of solving it for dy dx. All right, let's look at the last example. We have just enough time. We have eight minutes. We're going to get it in. All right, what are they asking me to find in example seven? To the two, what is that? That's not the first derivative, the second derivative. All right, there are two options for this, and I'm going to show you both, and then I'll tell you which one I prefer. All right, the option A is I'm going to, either A or B, the first step is the same. I need to find the derivative of the original equation. It's not solved for Y, so I have to use implicit. So both A and B start the same way. I'm going to find the derivative of the original equation with respect to x, and I'm going to do the same thing to the other side. So they both start exactly the same way. What's the derivative of 2x cubed? 6x squared minus the derivative of 3y squared, 6y dy dx, equal to 0. And then here's where your strategies can go. Now I want to find the second derivative. You have two options. Option one, this is A. Solve for dy dx, then take the second derivative. Did everybody see how this is kind of similar to what we were doing before? Or option B, take the second derivative and then solve for the second derivative with respect to x. So I can either solve and then take the derivative, or I can take the derivative and then solve. All right, let's start with a. I need to solve this for dy dx. So I'm going to subtract 6x squared, divide by negative 6y. So dy dx is equal to Subtract negative, subtract 6x squared, but then I divide by negative 6y, so I end up with x squared over y. So I solve for dy dx. And then I know that the second derivative of y with respect to x is really me taking the derivative of the derivative, right? Is everybody okay with that, that that's what the second derivative means? So taking the derivative of the derivative, I do not need to do implicit because I am taking, well, initially, this, right? I'm just doing substitution. This means this, take the derivative of the derivative. I know a formula for the derivative, it's this. So now I'm taking the derivative of that. What do I have to use, though, to take that derivative? I got to use quotient rule, right? Because I have x squared over y squared. So I'm like, all right. But now we got, what do we have to remember? The derivative of y is a dy dx. So I'm going to do low d high minus high d low, which is dy dx, 
all over low squared, y squared. Now, unfortunately, they're not going to let you leave it here. Because right now, you have a formula for the second derivative that includes the first derivative. They don't let you leave that in there. But that's okay. Don't we have a formula for that? So we have one more step. We are going to put this in. We want to get rid of dy dx. So my final answer, the second derivative with respect to y or the second derivative of y with respect to x is going to be 2xy minus x squared over y times x squared, so x to the fourth over y, all over y squared. Now, just for future, if they just said find dy dx, I'd walk away from it. But just because I want to compare this to something in part b, I am going to get rid of the fractions within fractions, multiply by y over y, so 2xy squared minus x to the fourth over y cubed. That's just a nicer form. All right, so everybody okay with method one? Solve for dy dx, take the second derivative. All right, now let's contrast that with b. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take the second derivative and then solve. So it's kind of like you're doing the second derivative implicitly. So we're going to take the derivative with respect to x of the entire side of this equation. I'm not even going to, I'm not going to solve. I'm just going to bring it in just as written and just take the derivative a second time. Because isn't the second derivative mean I took the derivative twice? So I took the derivative implicitly. Now I'm going to take the derivative Again, now here's where you have to be careful doing this one. First one's easy. What's the derivative of 6x squared? 12x, done. Minus, then this is the sticky point. What do I have to use here? Product rule, because I have a product of 6y and dy dx. All right, so let's put parentheses there and we'll come back to that one. All right, and then what's the derivative of a constant? All right, so that's equal to zero. So I got to use my product rule on this part right here. All right, so we have the first, I already have the minus out there, so I'm just looking at 6y, times the derivative of the second. What's the derivative of the derivative? Second derivative, so d2y over dx squared, plus, remember I already have the minus out here, so then I would have the second, dy dx, times the derivative of the first. What's the derivative of 6y? dy dx, right? Everybody okay? Just did product rule. First times derivative of the second plus second times derivative of the first. Now, be very, very careful in this next step. So I have 12x minus 6y second derivative of y with respect to x plus, actually minus because I'm distributing the negative, uh, what's this going to be? And does everybody see that dy over dx squared, even if it looks sort of like that, are they the same thing? No, this is the derivative of the derivative. This is take the derivative that you found and square it. Two different things. What are we trying to solve for? The second derivative. So I'm going to solve for this. Don't go yet. Subtract everything over, divide by 6y. So your second derivative of y with respect to x squared would equal 6 times dy dx squared minus 12x divided by negative 6y. And you may be like, are we done? And I'm like, no, because you're not allowed to have dy dx there. Well, it's a good thing I did it the other way earlier because I know what that is. So I'm going to put my x squared y in. x to the fourth over y squared, because I squared it, minus 12x over negative 6y. And you might be wondering, is that the same thing we got earlier? Multiply by y squared over y squared to clear your fraction. 
6x to the fourth minus 12xy squared over negative 6y cubed. And then what can I do? Everything's divisible by 6. Actually, let's divide everything by negative 6. Pull that out. Negative x to the fourth plus 2xy squared over negative 6y cubed. That cancels, and can y'all see that this and this are the same? Now, which version do you think I prefer? The first. the first is way easier. I would always go with the first. 